You talked uh, last night, and you write about uh, Ruby Hurley, who, you know, sadly is just a forgotten fi figure in the history of the movement. W what did you learn from her? What did she teach you? She taught me about the mechanics of organizing. Mm. Uh, she taught me about how to give leadership to to people who were afraid, how to make them feel comfortable in their leadership. Uh, she taught me a lot, and you know this is chairman of the board of the NAACP, that there are local politics and there are regional politics and there are national politics. And these politics, you know, play against mm -hmm. each other. She controlled Region 5. And she was Mr. Wilkins' person. She was a very loyal NAACP, and so she she helped him withstand the attacks of Eugene Reed, just died in New York, who was sort of a radical, always on the other side, uh, and Bill Booth from New York. I mean, these guys were were genuinely NAACP people who had a different point of view, and that was a healthy tension in that dissent and dissension. Uh, but Ruby heard it taught me how to manage dissent and how to be a leader. And from the NAACP, um, Arkansas, and then to the Voter Education Project, and here is another, this is another world for you. Uh, as opposed to the hierarchical NAACP and these regional, state, local branches and divisions and politics, you're in a relatively brand new organization that has a board of directors, but really takes some direction from the foundations who originally funded it. So how has this changed? But the change was, it was a very healthy change, because mm -hmm. this was the interracial mm -hmm. uh, leaders of the South who cared, liberals and moderates, black college presidents, deans, lawyers, uh, who were brought together under the bankers, mm -hmm. John Herbert Wheeler, uh, but also liberal whites from the South who really, who really cared. And that was a different dynamic. And it was a research organization to bring facts to life about the, the horrors of segregation and, and discrimination. But it was a logical step uh, for me. Mm -hmm. I, I worked for this marvelous man, Leslie Dunbar, PhD uh, from Cornell who was committed to research. And that process at the Southern Regional Council taught me the value of, of research and how to use it. And that's when I started reading the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Washington Post every day. I've been doing it ever since. Mm -hmm. uh, because fact gathering and understanding of events was, was, was very important. And it was also the first job where I had clear administrative responsibilities. I was in charge of the budget, and I had to present the budget. And so, and it was also the first time that I ever took a proposal to a foundation in New York to argue its merits and to defend it and to ultimately get funded. Leslie Dunbar sent me to the Ford Foundation uh, during that time. And you're also in charge of an interracial staff, which right. is new for you. In charge of interracial staff, managing that staff, mm -hmm. uh, uh, resolving s disputes within that staff, making decisions about hiring and firing. Um, that, was, that was a necessary step in this process of growing up. Mm -hmm. Now, Along this way, you give the Emancipation Day speech for the Atlanta NAACP, and uh, the local paper raves over this speech. And in it, you talk about the necessity for these older institutions in Atlanta, like the Voters League, to change and adapt to new circumstances, new people like the Young Turks, very much like Eugene Reed and Bill Booth. What prompted this? What, what made you think of this? First of all, that was 1965. Mm -hmm. Ten years earlier, that speech had been given by Martin. And when we left Bethel Church, I said to my father, to his great 
disbelief. I mean, he just looked at me like I was crazy. I said, Daddy, you know what? I'm going to make that speech one day. Mm -hmm. And in 1965, I was fortunate enough to be true to my promise to my father. What most appealed to me, and I get to your point, about that speech is that I was really doing what I promised my dad that I was going to do. It took place at Union Baptist Church. Sitting on the platform in the pulpit that day was A.T. Wallen mm -hmm. in braces. Mm -hmm. And when I finished, I got from him the blessing. Mm -hmm. He fixed his braces and he walked over to me and he said, son, you hit a home run. And I felt like that was a laying on of hands, that that was, that was Mr. Walding saying that I had, as we were saying, the fraternity across the burning sands. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, uh, uh, it was a very special moment. I don't remember what I said in that speech. You've obviously read it. Uh, I remember the Atlanta Daily World wrote an editorial about it. Mm -hmm. And Sam Cook, who was then a professor at the Political Science Department at Atlanta University, he said, if C.A. Scott wrote an editorial about your speech, it must have been one hell of a speech. Uh -huh. <laughs> but it was, it, was a, it was a kind of affirmation, mm -hmm. uh, a confirmation process for me that I was on the leadership track mm -hmm. uh, and to have been asked uh, five years after law school to give the Atlanta Emancipation Proclamation Day speech was a big speech and it was a big event mm -hmm. and it was I was so honored and pleased to have been able to do that.